Diplomatic reasons. I said, you've done us out of our bonus. A huge clearance goes upfield and Bentley takes it from here. I was asked, would we win the cup? And I thought we might. But I thought we had a great chance of winning the championship even better. Lumpstone, Lumpstone back to Green. Oh, Thank you back very well as the chance of a great shot. At Campbell's got to do it on his own. And he can do. I won't let it die. These players won't let it die. Wilkins, beautifully rifle in. It must be every fan's ambition to own a club. Own a club. Own a big club. You know, own a great club. And an institution. And that's what Chelsea is. It's unique. Nevin with Wilson. He's got round him. Will he try one from here? What a superb goal by Nevin. A lifetime supporting Chelsea has been a lifetime of promises, promises. Expectations aroused, only occasionally fulfilled. The failures have often been glorious, the successes all the more rewarding. 1989 was more joyous than many. A record run without defeat, promotion as champions. The Chelsea faithful never doubted that a return to Division I was inevitable. This, after all, is a club born with the highest expectations. It started life in the Football League and has known nothing else. A corner of southwest London, 1865. A cricket ground, an orchard, a market garden, a cemetery. Thirty years later, suburbia has arrived, fed by the new underground railway. Beside it, the Stamford Bridge Athletic Grounds have been established. The London Athletic Club headquarters was here, a venue without rivals so close to central London. International matches were staged. The Three A's Championships were still being held here at the beginning of the 1930s. 
it was Henry Augustus Mears who changed its destiny. With his brother JT, Gus Mears owned one of London's major building contractors. He bought Stamford Bridge, intending to make it the country's finest stadium. Soil and clay excavated from the Piccadilly Line tube tunnels provided embankments. When the work was complete, Mears expected that Fulham, then a Southern League club, would move to Stamford Bridge. Fulham refused, so Mears resolved to fill the new ground by forming a new club. Inspiration came from the enthusiasm of Frederick Parker, a former starter at the London Athletic Club, now a close friend of the Mears brothers. It was Parker who argued that the new club's name should be Chelsea. Undeterred when it became clear that the Southern League wouldn't have them, Parker raised his sights. He persuaded the Football League to vote Chelsea into the second division. To match the standard set by their ground, they'd already signed a squad of experienced players. John Tate Robertson from Glasgow Rangers was player manager. He scored Chelsea's first league goal. Willie Fulk, an England international with an FA Cup winner's medal, was the goalkeeper. Willie was 31 years old, 6 feet 2 and 22 stone 3. The first home fixture in the league was on Monday, 11th of September, 1905, kick-off 5 o'clock. Hull City were the opponents, Chelsea won 5-1, the attendance was 6,000. The next game at the bridge drew 20,000. When Manchester United came in April, it was 67,000. What Fulham thought isn't recorded. Frederick Parker's advocacy was fully justified, third place for the newcomers. That summer, Chelsea signed a 21-year-old forward named George Hilston from West Ham. He introduced himself by scoring five times against Glossop in the opening league game. His total for the season was 27. The weather vane, still at Stamford Bridge today, features a footballer modelled on Hilston, whose shooting earned him the nickname Gatling Gun and won Chelsea immediate promotion. After only two seasons, they were in the first division. An even more celebrated name led the team out in a benefit match at the end of that season. He created such a good impression that Chelsea signed him on amateur forms. He was George Roby, beginning an enduring link between the club and show business, even though sometimes the joke has been on Chelsea. In 1907, a new manager took over, David Calderhead, another Scot. He stayed for 26 years, surviving two relegation seasons. Both times, he led the Blues back to Division I. Chelsea also began to impress in the FA Cup. They reached the 1911 semi-final before losing to Newcastle. During the war, the great amateur centre forward Vivian Woodward came back from the front line in time to play in the final itself. But Woodward refused to deny Bob Thompson his chance of a medal. Thompson wasn't fully fit and Chelsea lost 3-0 to Sheffield United. The first season after the war was the club's best so far. Third in the first division, FA Cup semi-finalists. Had they beaten Aston Villa, they would have had home advantage in the final, played at Stamford Bridge. In those post-war years, no one endeared himself more to the fans than Andy Wilson, a centre-forward converted to a brilliant dribbling inside forward. Wilson captained the side for six second division seasons when promotion just eluded them. But in 1930, after being in doubt until the very last game of the season, Chelsea rejoined the upper classes. Back among the toffs, Chelsea spent like toffs. They went for the best they could get and never mind the price. Their first ever £10,000 cheque bought Huey Gallagher, the finest centre forward in the land. Although only five feet five, Gallagher had been scoring freely for Newcastle and Scotland. Chelsea too would get value for money. Alec Chain came from Aberdeen for £6,000, a winger converted to inside forward. Soon they were joined by Alec Jackson, a winger known as the Gay Cavalier, £8,500 from Huddersfield. The grass at the bridge had never seemed greener. Approaching the first fixture, Jackson and Andy Wilson bubbled with optimism. Well, Andy, there's all the people. Tell them what we're going to do next season, eh? Oh, well, you're one of the big noises. You know what I mean? You're the big noise, and along with Gallagher and Sheen and, and a few more of the boys. Well, it's up to you, boys. Well, we're going to try hard enough. I want the captain to set us a good example. Oh, well, we'll do our very best for that. And of course, all the boys are fitting that, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Did what you? about the Arsenal? 
Oh, half their team hasn't signed yet. Hey, that's Jack Whitley coming. Oh. <laughs> the forwards were all internationals, with the four Scots joined by England's Jackie Crawford on the right of this picture. Tommy Law was another who played for Scotland. The hard-tackling left-back was one of the famous Wembley Wizards. There were games including nine men who played for their country. There was an all-international half-back line, Sam Irving from Ireland, Jack Townrow and Sid Bishop from England. Money spent brought money in. The first five home gates were all 50,000 or more. Arsenal, in November, drew 75,000. But despite a convincing cup victory over West Ham in foggy, frosty January, it was the same old Chelsea underneath. They finished 12th in the league and lost in the sixth round of the cup. The following season, Gallagher fulfilled every expectation. 41 games, 30 goals. His temper was as short as his stature. On one occasion, he asked if he could leave the pitch to cool down. But when the aggression was properly channelled, few defences could curb him. Against Tranmere, when Chelsea wore their striped change kit, Gallagher scored both goals in a two-all draw. That launched an FA Cup assault that carried them through to the last four. It was Chelsea's third semi-final. Gallagher had the stimulus of playing against his former club. But as in the 1911 semi-final, Newcastle were too good for them. In 1933, Leslie Knighton became manager, but despite his experience at Main Road and Highbury, he could never lift Chelsea higher than eighth. Goalkeepers were often the saviours of the Blues in those interwar seasons. Vic Woodley was good enough to play 19 times for England in three years. He needed to be because Scotland's first choice, Johnny Jackson, was in Chelsea's reserves. Whatever the results, the crowds kept coming. Nearly 83,000 saw Arsenal in October 35, a Stamford Bridge record never to be officially beaten. And the tradition of powerful centre-forwards continued. George Mills, who played throughout the 30s, was the first to score 100 league goals for Chelsea. He was partnered for a while by Joe Bambrick, but the Irish international never quite reproduced his best form. Joe Payne, who had scored 10 goals in a game only two years earlier, cost £5,000. In wartime, Chelsea played in two Wembley Cup finals, losing to Charlton and beating Millwall. Billy Birrell, who'd been appointed manager in May 1939, started the post-war reconstruction by signing Everton and England's Tommy Lawton. In the now well-established club tradition, he paid £11,500 for the best centre-forward to be had. The new man's first game was a friendly, the opponent's Moscow Dynamo. It was no ordinary friendly. The Russians startled their opponents by presenting a bouquet to each man. Estimates put the crowd at nearly 100,000. They saw Chelsea lead 2-0. Dynamo made it 2 all, And then... Taylor through to Dolding. Dolding right through in the centre of the penalty area for Russia. And in goes Lawton. Lawton hooks the ball right out of Hobich's hands. He comes back to Lawton, the header, and the header. Goal! A beautiful goal by Lawton! What a goal! But Lawton's delight wilted faster than his flowers. I'll always remember the third goal that they got, this Bob off. He was 10 yards offside. And do you know what this commander Campbell is now? I'll never forget him. The referee. He said, well, I gave it for diplomatic reasons. <laughs> now I ask you. <laughs> so I said, diplomatic reasons? I said, you've done this out of our bonus. Lawton scored 30 goals in 39 games as football returned to normality in 1946. Lawton was a magnet. More than a million people passed through the Stamford Bridge turnstiles. But somewhere, somehow, the relationship soured. Tommy Lawton went, Roy Bentley came. He cost £11,000 from Newcastle. Bought as an inside forward, he was soon leading scorer, wearing the number nine shirt. Chelsea entered the 1950s needing cup kudos to salvage another moderate first division season. They reached the sixth round and drew Manchester United. 70,000 crowd Stamford Bridge for the cup tie of the season. Attacking the goal to your right, here is a new Chelsea. Fine teamwork, allied with non-stop attack, bring the Londoners an early reward. 
The man who puts the finishing touch is Bobby Campbell. And here it is. Nothing will go right for the men from Manchester. After throwing everything into the attack, they find their Wembley dreams dashed in a sudden Chelsea breakaway. From a Mitchell throw-in, the ball goes via Gray to Roy Bentley, who smashes it home. Look out, Wembley. Here come Chelsea. On paper, it looked a cup clash of the century. An action that's just what it turns out to be. Arsenal attacking the goal to your right and Chelsea make it a cup semi-final to remember. A Hughes clearance goes upfield and Bentley takes it from here. Arsenal hit back only to find Hughes give a repeat version. Once again his hefty long kick finds elusive Roy Bentley and Chelsea are two up. A Cox corner kick does the impossible dropping smoothly into the net. With only 15 minutes to go, Chelsea seem set for their first ever Wembley. But Arsenal have other ideas, as the Gunners throw everything into an all-out assault. It comes off, thanks to the Compton brothers. From a Dennis corner, elder brother Leslie heads in the equaliser. The perfect ending to the perfect match. Freddie Cox settled the replay in extra time, and Arsenal again played Box and Cox with Chelsea's Cup dreams two years later, when Freddie's goals buried them in another semi-final replay. In the season between, only the narrowest margin of goal average avoided relegation. 0.044 was Chelsea's advantage over Sheffield Wednesday. Extensions and improvements kept Stamford Bridge among the elite of British stadia. On the field, glamour and excitement were rarely lacking, but the cupboard remained bare. No cups, no major titles. Enter in 1952 Ted Drake, a new manager with new ideas about how to achieve the old ambitions. As a player with Arsenal, Drake had scaled the peaks. At Chelsea, he didn't intend to linger for long in the foothills. I had a feeling that they were very cup-minded. And I said to the players, I would like to win the cup, of course, but I would dearly love to win the league. And they really gave me the impression that they had no chance. Drake tackled the image first. Just as George Roby had begun the music hall link, so the club's hospitality to the pensioners of Chelsea Hospital had also backfired. You don't like that tag, pensioners, do you, Ted? Not really, uh, Max, no. From the affection side, it's quite OK. But from the old music hall joke, no. I think, uh, if I can, I'd like to replace it with something else. The new badge was a lion rampant. Drake's next objective was to make it raw. In his first programme notes, he asked the fans to be not just louder, but more committed, more partisan. I, I knew that in time, I would eventually come to a younger side, because that was always my ambition. And of, you've got to get a crowd behind youngsters, haven't you? Among managers, the trilby was giving way to the tracksuit. Drake was one of the first to leave the office for the training ground to put skills on a par with stamina. And there was another policy change. Round the nucleus of his inherited side, Ted recruited not stars, but bargains from less obvious sources. Ron Greenwood, a wartime Chelsea player, signed from Brentford. Peter Sillett, a fullback from Southampton. Stan Wicks, who played under Drake at Reading. Chick Thompson from Clyde to keep goal. Amateur international Derek Saunders from Walthamstow Avenue. John McNichol, age 27, from 3rd Division Brighton. Seamus O'Connell, another amateur from Bishop Auckland. 18-year-old Frank Blunston from Crewe. Plus Les Stubbs and trainer Jack Oxbury. Ted Drake had warned that he would need three years to make a serious bid for the championship. He was patient through two modest seasons. 
1954-55 began better. In October, Roy Bentley scored his 100th league goal for the Blues. A fortnight later, Manchester United were the visitors. There was another huge crowd and they were not disappointed, even though Chelsea lost 6-5. Jimmy Thompson phoned up. Would always phone whenever he was going away watching. Would always phone through the result. And he phoned through this, 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 this time. And um, I said to him, we've gone down to Manchester United 6-5. And I said, Seamus have got three. Just imagine. And uh, before I could say another word, he said, now, don't worry at all, Governor. I've got a better player than any of those. And do you know who it was? Jimmy Greaves, our famous schoolboy international, that proved to be possibly one of England's greatest players. Chelsea slipped to 12th after suffering four successive defeats, but Drake's belief in the unlikely team he'd assembled wasn't shaken. He was justified by an away victory over Champions Wolves. Chelsea returned to the bridge for a prestige friendly against Red Banner. Hungary's footballers were the yardstick of the 50s. Outside right, Sandoy's there to take the pass. A centre finds Hidi Kuti, who heads it home. Red Banner went up in the 19th minute. The centre to Bentley, who heads it to Stubbs, and there's Chelsea's first. One all now, and Chelsea are off again with Blundstone in the picture once more. McNichol takes the centre. Bentley shoots, and it's a goal. Red Banner take control for most of the second half, and here they go on the raid that leads to the equalising goal. Palotas is the man who makes it 2 all. A fair result to a close contest. In the league, Wolves, Portsmouth, Sunderland, the two Manchester clubs, Aston Villa, all had hopes of the title. Chelsea edged upwards, a couple of wins here, a draw there, keeping their nerve after a setback. Prospects looked hopeful, but the champions still had to come to Stamford Bridge. 75,000 saw them. Just imagine to beat Wolves to win the championship or, or, or the setting to win the championship. And uh, Wolves were a great side in those days. And uh, great match. It was a great match. And um, we had uh, an amateur playing for us, Seamus O'Connell. And he fired this ball in the net. I thought, God, it was it's in. And Billy Wright dived and punched it over the bar. Never forget that. And it was done so neatly that I wondered, had the ref seen it? But there was the linesman with his flag up. And um, as arranged before the game, Peter Sillett was to take the off uh, penalty. And Peter striding up towards the penalty spot when he looked across at me and I was in the... <laughs> and he read my mind, as I know he did, and uh, Peter crashed it past the goalkeeper. And, uh, that more or less won the championship for us, yes. But with three games to play, Wolves or Portsmouth could have stolen the title. Chelsea went to Fratton Park, never a soft touch. O'Connell couldn't play, he was at Wembley with Bishop Auckland winning the Amateur Cup. The skimpiest of offsides denied Chelsea a goal. It was nil-nil, one win would do it. <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday came to the bridge, already relegated a sacrificial offering to celebrate Chelsea's first ever championship in their jubilee year. Remember those jokes about the pensioners? No more of those now. Watch those boys go. The first one comes from Parsons' head. And doesn't that head get a ruffling by his jubilant teammates? A penalty goal by Sillett. A third goal by Carson soon after, and it's all over. Fifty years on, Stamford Bridge at last had a centrepiece for the frame designed by Gus Mears. And that wasn't all. That season, the reserves, the A-team and the juniors all won their respective league titles. Well, on behalf of the boys, I want to say thank you. There's no need to tell you how pleased we are to win the championship. But we're pleased for you, because you've been behind us in other years, and more so this year. So again, from the bottom of our hearts, I say thank you very much. This is the happiest moment of my life.
I was asked, would we win the cup? And I thought we might. But I thought we had a great chance of winning the championship even better. I was delighted. I was delighted for everybody, of course, down there. I would have given my right arm to one subject for Chelsea, and uh, I achieved it. I was so pleased for one bunch, and that was the players. Yeah. This little Eric Parsons, he was a diamond of a boy. He got some stick from the crowd. In fact, they would call him Rabbit. John McNichol, he served me well at inside forward. Johnny McNichol scores the equaliser. Roy Bensley. There weren't many better centre forwards in there. He thought that I was crazy that, that we could win the championship. Possibly the cheapest buy in, in life, I should think, was Frankie Blumstone from the Blumstone going through on his own, and it's a great goal. Fans celebrated not just the achievement, but the expectation of more of the same. But the 54 55 team was a one off. They'd given everything probably outreached themselves in one supreme, sustained effort. By the start of the following season, Willemsey, Parsons, Bentley and Armstrong were all 30, McNichol 29, John Harris at 37, virtually at the end of his playing career. Youth was still represented by Blunston, and he was joined by 21-year-old Bobby Smith and by Ron Tindall, barely 20. But the magic had gone. Chelsea finished 16th. Roy Bentley was leading scorer for the eighth successive season. Of all the Chelsea strikers, few were more successful, none more durable. Bentley's boots didn't stay empty for long. A young man from East London, bursting with talent, had been attracting television cameras even before he appeared in the first team. And no wonder, in his last season before signing full professional forms, he scored more than a hundred goals. His name was Jimmy Greaves. It first appeared on the programme for a league fixture in August 1957. The game was against Tottenham Hotspur. The goal he scored was the introduction to a career without parallel in modern football. Pass to Greaves, and it's a goal! Yes, Greaves has scored! And so, young Jimmy Greaves keeps up his fantastic record of a goal a game in his Football League career. Look at forward now to Jimmy Greaves. Greaves going through on his own, and he scores! This was one of three occasions when Greaves scored five in a match for Chelsea, and Wolves were on their way to becoming champions. At the age of 18, Greaves had already won his first England caps. He was an international star, a family man with a house that proclaimed his allegiance. The goals came in seemingly endless profusion. At home, the trophies and mementos multiplied in proportion. Here come Chelsea on the attack again. Brooks getting it out to Lundstone. Lundstone back to Greaves. He's hanging back very well. It's a chance of a great shot. Chelsea boards crowding into the middle as Greaves trying to work into a shooting position. The great goal! Oh, a very, very fine goal indeed by Greaves. But, like love in the song, this affair was too hot not to cool down. In April 61, Jimmy Greaves was captain for the day in his final game before leaving for Italy. He came here to Chelsea four years ago in 1957 as a 17-year-old, and he'd scored 100 goals for him before he was 21. Wolves, Preston North End, West Bromwich Albion will all remember the five goals that he scored against them in a match. Bunsen breathes in the middle, says Braybrook. Greaves gets his hit. There's a great goal from Greaves. Braybrook. Oh! What a... Tremendous cracker of a shot. The is there. 
Greaves to Blunston. Blunston, this running ball. Sideways, Greaves! Oh, the hat-trick for Greaves in his last appearance. One wonders with some desperation what Chelsea will do without him next year. Greaves signed off with four goals. His season's total was 41, a club record. When he disappeared into the tunnel, the fans felt almost as though they'd seen a mirage, shimmering and exciting, but too good to be true. The figures, though, didn't lie. The end of the Greaves era began the end of the Drake era. Ted had become the first man to win the league championship as a player and as a manager. His place of honour at Stamford Bridge will always be as the man who gave Chelsea the prize that had been coveted for half a century. Right, lads, we're going to demonstrate the throw-in. So I'll make sure and practice this movement. The both your hands are cut behind the ball, both feet on the ground, behind the line. The ball must be propelled from behind the head onto the field of play to one of your inside forwards. So now, from now, let's get on to the field and we'll practice this. Come on now. Tommy Doherty had arrived as player coach in February 1961. When Drake was sacked the following September, Doherty, aged 32, and with no managerial experience at all, was put in charge. Well, of course, I was coach one day, I was Tom, the next day I was boss. And I repeatedly rang up Mark Busby, Don Ravey, Joe Mercer, uh, Bill Nick, Tottenham. Uh, if I was in a quandary at any time or then little problems, they were all very, very helpful to me. So really, I was thrown in at the deep end, it was a case of sink or swim, and. Uh, I had to learn very, very quickly. You sold a lot of players. Yeah, <clears throat> I sold a lot and we gave a lot away as well because they weren't good enough. And uh, really, that's basically what was wrong. We, it was a team getting old together and they needed replacing. And we had the team at the bridge. We had a lot of kids at the bridge at the time just waiting to get the uh, person to get into the first team. When Chelsea were relegated, the young manager threw his young players into a bold bid to make instant recompense. A lovely centre now, can Bridges get a shot in, and that's the first goal. In their penultimate match at Sunderland, Tommy Harmer scored his only goal for Chelsea, but promotion was still in the balance. It all came right at home to Portsmouth. Chelsea won 7-0, goal average mathematics did the rest. Doherty's judgement of young potential was totally vindicated. I brought Venables in, uh, Harris of course, and his brother Alan, a lad called Butler, Bert Murray, uh, Barry Bridges. And I realised that I had to get a breath of fresh air into the club by bringing the kids through and giving them a chance. Uh, but I'd like to emphasise that I didn't bring any of the kids there. Dickie Foss, who was a youth team coach, he, him and Jimmy Thompson, the scout, they brought them all there, and a lad called Wolf Chitty, he used to scout for as well. They were responsible for bringing those players out. I was only responsible for giving them an early opportunity. Among the new constellation, Bobby Tambling was one of the brightest. The way he'd taken on the Greaves role had won him two England caps while he was still a second division player. This goal was in his second international against France. Chelsea now were more than just a bunch of precocious teenagers. The new all-blue strip showed fashion sense, and there was a stylish swagger to their play that made Stamford Bridge a fashionable place to be. 64-65 was another million spectator season. Graham trying to get inside Murray, a goal! Right wing corner, so knocks the outside left to take it. Oh, it's a goal! It's a goal scored by the inside right, Graham. I should think that quite a few teams are going to have trouble with Chelsea this season. On to Harris. There's McCready up there again with the attack now. This could be dangerous. And it's the third goal. Ken Shelito laughing all over his face. Knocks again. Graham. 
the toe of Bremner. Collins to Venables. Johansson back in defense. Hunter to Collins. Ooh, he could have put his team in trouble, Hollins. And a goal. It was in this season that Chelsea unveiled another smooth-cheeked youngster who was soon to become an idol at the bridge. Skill, great attitude, two great feet, great in the air, marvellous heart. What more is there? Peter Osgood. His debut was in a fifth-round League Cup tie against Workington. He scored twice, then went back to the reserves. But Chelsea went on to win the League Cup, then an infant competition in only its fifth season. Eddie McCready played centre-forward in the first leg of the final against Leicester and scored. As the season moved towards its climax, the Blues were prominent on all fronts. Their FA Cup run took them to their first semi-final for 13 years. They played at Villa Park, a seat of football history, destined to become entwined with Chelsea's history more than once during the Doherty regime. Their opponents in 1965 were Liverpool, the reigning league champions. I remember we arrived at the, the ground and going into the dressing room, Terry Venables and I, and Shanks was standing at the uh, home dressing door, which they'd been allocated, of course, and just whistling away at himself. And he looked at Terry and I and said, uh, I, son, uh, you're good enough to win it next year, he says. Liverpool kick off against Chelsea in the semi final at Villa Park. Chelsea in the darker shirts. The Londoners expect to win, and before long, Liverpool goalkeeper Lawrence is brought into action. Hamlin takes it, and Mortimer heads in for Chelsea, but it's disallowed. No score at half time. And then Liverpool really come into the picture. A glorious goal by Thompson. Harris brings St. John down, and this time it is a penalty. From the spot, Stevenson scores. Liverpool win 2 0. The season ended in disarray. Three defeats in the northwest, eight players sent home for sneaking out of the team's Blackpool Hotel. I must admit that I was too much of a sergeant major. I was far too strict uh, in hindsight now. But uh, they went out and uh, it was reported to me that they'd been out to two or three in the morning by the hotel porter, which I denied. I said it was that rugby team that was in the hotel. And I'd prove it to them. So we got the keys and we went to one of the bedrooms and two of the players who were supposed to be out were lying in bed fast asleep. And so I removed the top sheet and they were lying there with their suits and the column ties on. I don't know whether they'd just come in or they were ready to go back out again, but it was quite humorous at the time. Chelsea finished third in the league. Liverpool won the cup. The following season, the draw brought them together again. There he is. Osgood is good. That's what the Chelsea fans chant about this 18-year-old. A great prospect, this boy is. The thing to watch for in this match will be the overlapping of the Liverpool defenders. This fellow, the right-back Lawler and Yates. Not a Liverpool forward has scored since the middle of December. It shows you how dangerous the defenders are. Now Thompson. Oh, it's going to be a goal, St. John Hunt. It's there. Corner to Chelsea being taken by Tambling. Which is this an equaliser? Scored by Osgood. Holy. Cheerleaders on the cop are quite confident. They're still screaming for Liverpool, but it's Peter Osgood for Chelsea. Oh, what a beautiful mover this boy is. What a beautiful run. Well, it gives away my age, but that reminded me of David Jack at his best. And as the looking corner up goes Yates, beautifully taken by Bonetti. That's a good clearance. Venables. This is Harris, the right back and captain to Tambling. 
beautiful football by Chelsea. Comes Graham, looking unnoticed on the right. A lovely centre to Tamling, and that's a goal. That was a goal all the way. Free kick to Chelsea. Remember, Leeds now with ten men back in defence. Up goes Osgood. Graham. Hit the post. A goal. Tambling number 11. Go on, my little diamonds. They'll have to open out now. Doherty's Diamonds then trumped Shrewsbury and Hull City on their way to the semi-final. Back again to Villa Park, this time to play Sheffield Wednesday. It was a very, very heavy Villa Park, unfortunately, and it didn't suit our style of football at all. They had big defenders like uh, Vic Mobley was playing, you know, and Jerry Young, and uh, they had a fullback that used to chip a good winger, I forget his name now. But um, it, was, it was a heavy pitch and it didn't really suit the, the style of Chelsea Football Club. And a terrific roar greets Chelsea. And Chelsea looking like Inter Milan in blue and black stripes as against the Real Madrid colours of Sheffield Wednesday all in white. This is Phantom. It's a good one! Four to score! A goal! 60 seconds to go. As far as the Wednesday supporters are concerned, it's all over now. And here's Ford. He's got McCulliock in the middle. He's got Pew in the middle. There's McCulliock. A goal! That is it! McCulliock has scored against his old club. It hurt, but there was balm for bruised pride. Chelsea were still pursuing a European trophy in their second season of Fairs Cup football. Against Roma, Terry Venables put Chelsea ahead. Roma equalised, Venables scored again. It was a sour tie, but Chelsea reacted positively after Eddie McCready was sent off just before the half hour. Fine third goal completed Venables' hat-trick in a 4-1 victory. Having survived a battle in Rome in the second leg and then disposed of Vienna Sport Club in the next round, Chelsea then fell two goals behind away to Milan. I are watch now, 45 seconds left. Venables. Comes Boyle. Harris breaking on the right. And it's a goal! That could do it. It's a goal scored by Graham. And it's 15 seconds from the end. At Stamford Bridge, Bobby Tambling's corner set up an even more emphatic George Graham header. The scores were level on aggregate. Then came Osborne, four days before his 19th birthday, striking another superb goal. But Milan levelled on aggregate, and it took a third game, extra time, and the toss of a coin to get Chelsea through. Eventually, they met Barcelona in the semi-final, losing 2-0 in the new Camp although that first leg should have been in London. We were due to play them at the bridge, and uh, we had two or three injuries, and uh, two very good players, and uh, <clears throat> it was raining, uh, but not that heavy, and I arranged for the fire brigade to come in the night before and flood at the pitch even more, and the referee came to examine the pitch with his Wellingtons on, and uh, he says the pitch was unplayable, but they, none of them could fathom out where the rain came from during the night, but uh, I'd arranged that with uh, the local fire brigade. 
When they finally played at Stamford Bridge, the fire brigade gave way to the police force. The other boys in blue were needed after Barcelona had a man sent off. With 20 minutes left, an own goal gave Chelsea hope. 2-1 on aggregate became 2 all, courtesy of another own goal. But when they met for a third time, there was no rain in Spain nor charity from Barcelona. Chelsea lost 5-0. During the summer, Joe Mears died. Chairman of the Football Association, he sat on the Chelsea board from 1931 and was chairman for 26 years. The next season started with a new look. Murray, Bridges and Venables had gone. Charlie Cook was making his league debut. Now Cook. Let's see what he's made of. Graham up there with him on his left. Oh, fine goal. Beautiful goal by Cook. Good ball by Boyle to Cook. And tumbling the fine goal. Splendid effort. Chelsea much stronger in the tackle. And I was good to Tamlin. Tamlin's got to do it on his own. And he can move. Well, the Chelsea fans really taking the mickey out of Villanueva by just singing the tune of strolling. And that really is what Chelsea are doing. They're strolling through this match. Deservedly 3 0 up. And much the better for them. Was Graham. Graham again, maybe a shot for number four. Brilliant save at Tamling. Four. Tamling. Oh, Inkin, what a bad mistake. And Tamling's got the fifth. His own four. Number ten, Cook. And here's Boyle onside. Mistake by Tindall. Oh, you cheeky monkey. And there's the sixth goal, the fifth for Bobby Tindall. On October the 1st, the Blues won at Main Road. Peter Osgood was among the scorers as the unbeaten run from the start of the season extended to ten games. Chelsea, the top of the first division. But four days later, Osgood broke his right leg in a League Cup tie at Blackpool. Within days, Tommy Doherty had paid Aston Villa £100,000 for Tony Haitley. It was the club's first six-figure transfer fee. The new man's strike rate was less than one every three games, but there were important goals among them, helping Chelsea on an FA Cup run that reached the semi-final for the third successive season. People have said to me, oh, it's Villa Park again for the third year running. I hope it's Villa Park next year again for the fourth year running. Uh, I always feel that uh, if you're in a competition often enough and get to the last stages often enough and you're knocking the door often enough, uh, someone might open it for you. One of the keys to the door is fitness, and Chelsea, with four days to go, are anxiously nursing the recently maimed. Bobby Tambling, 27 goals this season, has got to be fit. One player will be especially familiar with Villa Park. Tony Haitley bought from Aston Villa to supplement the genius of young Peter Osgood, whose injured leg is now strengthening. Today's request by Osgood for a transfer is this month's story at a club where most of the disagreements between players and management have been argued out in a healthy, though surprisingly public fashion. But his players are all to Doherty. He's disciplined them, he's sacked them, he's sworn for them and been fined for it. He's publicly taken their side against the Chelsea board and been censured for it. He's worked many of them so hard that they've left. Yet he's warm, instantly likeable, and one hopes about to become a successful manager. One wonders whether a Chelsea team and its manager could withstand a third semi-final defeat in three years. Chelsea will have no illusions about Leeds United, but I feel that this time they might even beat their opponents and lay the ghost of Villa Park. Now McCready. Great dribbler, this boy. Hey, Cleo! A great goal! A 
minute to go. Giles with a free kick. Lorimer. A Chelsea's first cup final for over 50 years and their first ever final at Wembley. It's also the first final between two clubs from London. Spurs in white, Chelsea in blue. Dave Mackay of Spurs, Ron Harris of Chelsea and referee Mr Dagnall from Lancashire. No score until less than a minute before the interval. And here comes goal number one for Spurs. Mallory's shot rebounds to Jimmy Robertson. Chelsea's attack couldn't match their defence, but even that defence was to crumble again. A superb goal from Saul with his back to the net. Two goals down, Chelsea's John Hollins proves that they're not down and out. And suddenly they're only one goal down. A dramatic score by Bobby Tambling, but Spurs held them off and held on to a record only achieved once before. Five times cup finalists, five times victorious. Chelsea's hopes deflated like a balloon. In October 1967, Tommy Doherty left, typically in controversial fashion. Wherever he went in football, he generated a new dynamism, an element of flair on the field, and a feeling that any day something unforgettable might occur. Chelsea was no exception. With a little luck, he would have given them the FA Cup as well. The man summoned to steady a rocky boat was Dave Sexton. He was the player's choice as well as the board's. Dave had been at the club before, working in the coaching background under Tommy Doherty. In the first weeks of the season, Chelsea had already conceded five goals to Newcastle, six to Southampton, seven to Leeds. They were relegation candidates. Sexton's return wrought no miracles overnight, but at least Osgood was back and scoring. I put on two stone in weight, which didn't help, obviously, just sitting around. And unfortunately, I could never lose that weight. So it was a big disappointment to me because I honestly don't think I ever got back to, the, to that sort of style of play I used to play then. But recalling the goals he did score simply begs the question, how good might he have been? That was good. Baldwin Osgood, a fine move and the second goal. Webb. Osgood. That's 2 1. Baldwin Osgood coming in. Almost an accident, but it's a goal. And Osgood's face says it all. The smiles became contagious as Sexton lifted Chelsea remarkably to sixth. The next season, fifth. The following year, third. In November 1967, he had signed Alan Birchamor from Sheffield United. Fee, £100,000. Hancock's not back on the line yet. In February 68, David Webb arrived from Southampton in an exchange deal. Oh, what a great save, but it's a goal! A goal scored by Webb. 
July 1968, Ian Hutchinson, a 2,500 pound snip from Cambridge United. January 69, John Dempsey from Fulham for 70,000. Yes, Dempsey the line and it's there. The newcomers represented solidity to underpin some of the more mercurial talents Sexton inherited, not least the unpredictable genius of Charlie Cook. Uh, my main contribution is can be to sort of create something from maybe nothing. But apart from that, I, I've tried hard to make myself a much better professional into the bargain. Chelsea haven't been able to carve out many chances for themselves in this match, if any at all. Now, Cook, a bit of a ball to boil. Oh, a splendid goal. And there was another brilliant teenager tuning up in the Stamford Bridge forecourt. Alan Hudson, born and bred just round the corner. I hesitate to uh, to praise him too much because, after all, he is just 18 years old and uh, he's only been in the league side for three or four months. But um, I must say that uh, in those three or four months, he, he really has made very rapid strides. Uh, number eight, Hudson. It's a beautiful one. And Osgood, he scored! Over those three seasons, Sexton's developing side became opponents to respect. Collins, oh, he deserved it! He deserved it! Poor boys, oh, he got a good chance slip then. Harris really showing why he's got a hard man, not flinching at all, leaving few hurt. It's not few, in fact. Oh, a goal by Hutchinson! 1970 saw the departure of Bobby Tambling. No player has scored more goals for Chelsea. And about that time, Dave Sexton put into words a sentiment that echoed from decades past. Well, obviously, I hope that we'll, for the first time in Chelsea's history, we'll be bringing the cup back to, uh, to London. Birmingham, Burnley, Crystal Palace, Queen's Park Rangers were all beaten. Osgood scored in every round as Chelsea swept to their 10th FA Cup semi-final. And Dempsey right up! And it's there by Webb! David Webb! Hutchinson in turn laying it off for Hudson. There's Hausman outside him, Osgood in the middle. And Osgood! Peter Osgood! Still he goes, he's got a pretty tough left foot, is Hausman. Still he goes on, and a goal by Hausman! Hudson again, oh, through his legs. And now to Osgood. Hutchinson. Still Hutchinson. There he goes! Number four. Hutchinson. Oh, a nice little one two there for Hausman. There it is. Number five. And the 1970 Cup final is just about to begin, and it does begin on this soft sanded pitch which looks rather like the Goodwin Sands. Lorimer. The appeal, it's a corner. It's a corner. And Charlton again in the accustomed position on the goal line. Freddy with him and Osgood. 20 minutes gone, no score. And it's a goal! It's a goal! I think it, it's Charlton. 20 minutes, Leeds have taken the lead. Lee 
Leeds had everybody up in attack. Now they're packed in defence. Hollins. Hutchinson. Osgood. Oh, it's Charlton. Almost put through his own goal. Osgood. Looking at what he has to do to score. So five minutes from half-time. Jackie Charlton was the score. Houseman, a pure score! 41 minutes, and Scrape has let in a sitter. Clark on the left wing. Clark and Jones have moved to clear the cup in the middle. A wonderful save by Benetti. Again, four or five yards out of his goal to narrow the angle. Osgood. Hutchinson. And what great... Oh, no! These are in trouble. Hutchinson. Baldwin. Houseman. Hutchinson. And again, great goalkeeping. It's Osgood. And it's... Gray was fouled from behind, but... But two great saves by... By Sprake. Gray, who oh, we should have slotted it through to. Oh, he's hit the ball! Well, he did the right thing in the end. Grabbed it to Giles. Clark, it's hit the post! A goal, Jones! Jones has done it! So, five minutes left. Five minutes between Leeds and the Cup. Now then, it's a free kick to Chelsea. Brenda calling his men back. Atta Hollins with the free kick. Hutchinson, a goal! And Leeds players have gone flat up. But watch this as Hutchinson gets to the near post, gets right up to it. And Spraker's got no chance, a great near post goal by this youngster, Ian Hutchinson. And it's a draw in 1970, the first time since 1912 a great match has ended. Well, uh, we'll be moving Ronnie Harris across to right back because um, uh, I think that um, Ronnie can do a good job on Eddie and sort of uh, keep that flank quiet there. In fact, I'm sure he can. This is Gray. Joel Joe, oh, what a great save by Benetti. What oh, a tremendous save by Benetti. Maidley. Jones. And Benetti is hurt. Peter Benetti. Here's Cooper. Oh, what a save from Benetti. Oh, 10 out of 10. And one for neatness for Benetti for that save. Osgood. Now Hutchinson. Cook. position for one of his famous long ones near to the penalty box and up goes Dempsey and Webb as Hutchinson prepares to take the throw. What a throw that was. 
Dave Sexton much happier now. That's Marvin Hinton, the substitute on his left. But Dave Sexton always looks serious. And what an epic, memorable cup final this has been. Great game at Wembley, a great game here. Chelsea coming from behind the wall. Chelsea have won it. Chelsea have won it. After 65 years, the cup was won at last. Where others had come so close and failed, Sexton had succeeded. The one time I knew that Chelsea was going to win the FA Cup, you know, you just had a feeling that we were definitely going to win it. Was about, I think it was when 20 minutes to go when Dave Webb scored the goal. It was the first time I saw the Leeds players be behind in the, in the ties we'd had. At Wembley, they went in front twice. We came back twice. They went in front again at Old Trafford. And when we went in front, they laid down. And they couldn't match us. They said, we can't beat this squad. London, South West Six, a focal point of the swinging 60s, staged an old-fashioned knees up. Next season, the cup winners were back in Europe with a new £100,000 signing in the squad. Keith Weller from Millwall. Beautiful ball, Weller! First in the Cup Winners' Cup came Aris Salonika, hopeful after a draw in Greece, hammered at the bridge 5-1, including two goals from John Hollins. Paddy Mulligan now leaving it for John Hollins, bearing in fast with a left foot drive! <laughs> then CSKA, beaten 1-0 in Sofia, 1-0 at Chelsea, scorer David Webb. In the third round, Bruges took a 2-0 lead in the first leg, but Chelsea won through to knock out Manchester City, the holders. That booked a return to Greece, where the trail had begun, this time to Athens to play Real Madrid. We were winning 1-0, courtesy of Mr Osgood again, he scored another goal in the final, and uh, it was about 10 seconds to go, it was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, they'd even bought the cup out to, to present it, and they equalised, I mean, it was absolutely ridiculous, and uh, of course we had another replay. So we had to stay over, and uh, on the Thursday, I just went down to the Hilton with Charlie Cook and Tommy Baldwin and just got pie-eyed, really. I thought, our name's not on this one. We can't win it. Definitely a match in which Chelsea have been in full control throughout the whole of the first half hour. And now here's Webb on the break from Weller. And the corner kick. Well second by the goalkeeper, Borja. There's Tommy Baldwin there to put him under pressure. Cook to take the corner. And Dempsey has scored! And there it is, delighted Chelsea fans, and that's no more than Chelsea deserves. In this, the European Cup, Winners Cup final replay. They take the lead up for 32 minutes. John Dempsey, the scorer. Baldwin. Back to Harris. Number eight, Baldwin. Osgood. And he scored! Osgood has done it! That was a beautiful shot. I thought he'd have gone wide, but he picked his spot, and Osgood down, leaning down, and just waving at the crowd, and so after 38 minutes, Osgood has made it two. Well, they've got a quarter of an hour to go, two substitutes to use, but now Fletus for Real Madrid. He's done it, he scored! Real Madrid has scored! Fletus has got one in with 15 minutes to go. Randy moving down the right, this is Randy. Pity and Grosso in the middle. Grosso as well. And Panetti rises to the occasion the first time he's really been under pressure. That was a fine header by Sokol. And it's all over. The whistle has gone. Chelsea have won the European Cup Winners' Cup for the first time in the club's history. 
Chelsea's reputation as exciting nearly men was being demolished. This was the second trophy in two years. It inspired in 1971-72 a prolonged campaign in pursuit of another cup. Hollins. Osgood had never stopped going. And he's got it in, and it's given. Hausman again to take it. Yes, Garland! His first goal for Chelsea. Hudson. Number two, Mulligan. John Hollins to take it, four and a half minutes left, two goals each, 3-2. A 5-4 aggregate after two legs took Chelsea to their second League Cup final, by now a Wembley showpiece. They met Stoke City. Peter Dobing then with the throw for Stoke City. Smith is right up at the near post for Stoke. And Osgood had come back with him, and it was the fist of Bonetti. Turned in again, and now Greenoff looking for it, and Conroy! Terry Conroy! The little chip there again towards Webb, and Osgood, and Webb won't get a shot in, will he? Osgood on the ground, and he's done it, Osgood! While he was on the ground, he's got the equaliser. The first goal Osgood's ever scored at Wembley. Red shirts away to the pounce now. Conroy going past Webb. A delicate chip there, a deep one towards Richie. Nodded down again. And a good save. And Eastham. George Eastham. The old man has done it. It was nearly 70 years since Gus Mears had built his super stadium and founded a club to fill it. Now Chelsea had a team starting to win prizes, they planned to build a new stadium to house it. But what was intended with the best of motives to be the glory of the 70s became a major factor in a decade of many disappointments. Financing the rebuilding and the disruption to the ground created problems that inevitably affected the playing side through lack of atmosphere, if nothing else. Players like Hudson and Osgood soldiered on for a while. Hudson for Chelsea. Lock. The call. Hudson heard him. Osgood. Kemba. And it's Kelly in the way. Osgood. One nil. But the camaraderie born of success was under pressure. Peter Osgood departed for Southampton. The indelible memories he left behind are reinforced by the figures in the club annals. Soon Sexton himself, the most successful manager in Chelsea's history, went too. Well, it's, it's very sad, you know, um, but I haven't got any complaints, you know, they've been very good, a great club to work for. Ron Seward, who had a 16-year association with the club, became manager, but this was the start of a very unstable period. Seven months later, the job passed to Eddie McCready, for many years Chelsea's left back. His long-time partner on the field, Ken Shellito, became his successor as manager. Irish international Danny Blanchflower spent nine months in charge, but with no money available, couldn't avoid relegation. Having been coach under Blanchflower, Jeff Hurst inherited the manager's chair, but just missed getting the club back to the first division. It wasn't, though, a time of unbroken gloom. Eddie McCready had no option but to blood the youngsters, led by Ray Wilkins, already mature beyond his years. The new East Stand was open leaving Chelsea nearly three and a half million pounds in debt. But the raw playing talent was good enough to win promotion in 1977. Wilkins with the long ball. What a good one it was too to Basson. Charles comes across, good cross by Basson and Swain! Ray Wilkins was Chelsea's youngest ever captain at 18. Given his ability, he should probably have scored more goals. 
a lovely goal by the Chelsea skipper. But the range of skills and the intuitive awareness glowed in every game. Somehow, though, the promise of this generation suffered in the general blight of the 70s. The end of the decade saw the final appearances of two loyal and much-admired servants. Peter Bonetti had kept goal in 729 senior games. Not for nothing, as he called the cat. Peters. Oh, what a game Bonetti has played. And after 19 seasons, during which he set a club record of 795 appearances, Ron Harris departed. He didn't often trouble goalkeepers, but when he left, forwards all over the country rested a little easier. Harris! Beautifully hit shot by Ron Harris! John Neal became manager in 1981. Wilkins had long gone for £875,000, then a Chelsea record, but the restraint on buying players remained. I go up in here every day and you look out there and you get a tingling down your back. It's a tremendous setup, tremendous support. It's, you know, it's all there to be done. It's just a case of getting the team right. That's the most important thing of all. First, it came right only in odd matches, mainly in the FA Cup. Neil. McDermott. And Lee. And away goes Rhodes Brown. Now, has he got the nerve to hold on? He has! Chelsea ahead! Rhodes Brown, the scorer, his first goal of the season, and it puts the underdogs into the lead. Played there for Walker. Can Chelsea find something here? Oh, Lee. Chelsea couldn't sustain that form. They scored twice against Spurs in the sixth round, but lost. Nineteen eighty-two, a new chairman, Ken Bates, a man prepared to put his money where his mouth was, and never reticent about putting his mouth where his money was. A man who was going to make Chelsea noticed again, but wasn't prepared to put them through the bankruptcy court to do it. Well, to start with, it wasn't a football club, it was a social club, uh, with a bit of football played on Saturdays occasionally. It wasn't run as a business. There were far too many people on the payroll who weren't working. Even down, we, I think we had the only lottery in the league that lost money. While the chairman made sure the club didn't go bust, the manager was having a hard time keeping the team afloat. It was a partnership with a common ambition, but their first season together tested it to the limit. Following a draw at Craven Cottage in April, Chelsea took only three points from the next six games. In fact, from the east onward, we'll be saying, as soon as we're safe, we'll put the kids in and blood the kids and give them a chance. But our lot were so bad, they couldn't even get a safe by Easter. So we just had to hang in there. And on a wet Saturday afternoon at Bolton, a Clive Walker goal staved off relegation. Nevertheless, Chelsea finished in the lowest place in their history. The following season, money was at last available for players. There were six signings. Eddie Nitzvetsky, Joe McLaughlin, Nigel Spackman, Pat Nevin and John Hollins back at the bridge after eight years away. And there was Kerry Dixon, reviving memories of a long line of idolised number nines. The season started at home to Derby. Dixon scored twice, Chelsea won 5-0. And that was only the beginning. Flick on by Dixon for Speedy. That's good play by Chelsea. David Speedy. Chelsea must be looking for something here. It's Nevin. And here's Kerry Dixon with a great chance. And somehow he's made it. Dixon the target here. Hanover. Oh yes, Speedy, Dixon, what a fantastic goal, well that was perfection. Chelsea was sure of promotion with three games to play, the championship was still to be decided. We just passed coach after coach after coach after coach, it was like the Amada, ships astern. We're going to Grimsby to be in the championship. 
Kerry Dixon headed the goal that rewarded all their labours. John Neal, the architect, couldn't bear to watch and retired for a cup of tea. After five years in the second division, Chelsea were champions. The East Stand filled again to see how the Blues would cope with the new challenge. The Shed had little doubt. Hopkins there. So is Dixon Speedy. Yes! Nevin. Yes! Moving up a division did nothing to check the flow of Dixon goals. They also spilled over into the Milk Cup. Nevin, great play. Teasing cross two, and that's another. Dixon gets his hat-trick. But first, they had to go to Hillsborough, where they found themselves three down at half-time. Chelsea starting the second half with their substitute Paul Canaville on. Colin Lee's the man who's gone off. So Chelsea with problems at the start of the match, and they've got more now in the second half. Canaville playing out wide on the left and involved early. Oh, what a start! Was that his first touch of the ball? Astonishing! Speedy for Chelsea. Mickey Thomas. Kerry Dixon wasn't offside. Is this number 28? Kerry Dixon took that awfully well. A quality finish from a quality player. Spackman battling for possession. Speedy to Nevin. Now let's see something from little Pat Nevin. He forced a turn by Mick Lyons. Magic goal! by Mickey Thomas and incredibly Chelsea have pulled it back it's three apiece the ball for Dixon to chase and he'll get there oh he's found Canneville Chelsea have done it but still there was time for a Wednesday penalty equaliser Chelsea won the second replay, but the semi-final was a minefield. Joe McLaughlin dislocated his elbow in the first leg at Roker Park. Sunderland converted two penalties. In the second game, Clive Walker scored twice against his former club. Beaten 5-2 on aggregate, Chelsea's misery was compounded by crowd violence during and after the game. In May, David Speedy won his first cap for Scotland, and the following season his scoring feats lent distinction to a little considered competition. Chelsea won the nine goal final of the full members' cup. Still Chelsea in possession with McAllister, looking for Nevin, far side, away, not very far, another chance for Speedy. <laughs> Nevin so skillful on the ball and uh, gets round Reed, it might go in, it certainly does. Chelsea are the first winners of the full members' cup final. By now, John Hollins had been put in charge. The Blues finished sixth for the second successive season. But the man who'd been such a favourite as a player couldn't carry the fans with him as a manager. Discontent on the terraces became hysteria in the headlines. Bobby Campbell took over with Chelsea heading for the relegation playoffs. Despite Gordon Dury's second leg goal against Middlesbrough, they couldn't avert the drop. As if that were not enough, the hooligan element again made their unwanted contribution. Bobby Campbell knew there was no easy way back. He needed experience, steel and a leader on the field. He bought them in a package from Rangers, Graham Roberts to skipper the side and marshal the defence. Then he turned to Aberdeen for Peter Nicholas to do a similar job in midfield. The start wasn't good, three points from six games. That was followed by an upturn and then a flourish against Plymouth. 
Terry Dixon was among the scorers. And so was Gordon Dury, a still maturing striker brought to the club by John Hollins. You box Dury, well, he doesn't know how good he, how good he could be. People say he's going to be this, he's going to be that. They don't know how good he's going to be. Because when you live with him and you see him in training, and you see his assets and his quality, he doesn't know how good he's going to be. And once he, once he reaches maturity at the age of 23, 24, he will be something. Here at Walsall, Geary became the first Chelsea player since Bobby Tambling to score five goals in a league game. When Bobby Campbell paid the club's biggest fee, £725,000, for goalkeeper Dave Besant, Chelsea were already well into a club record sequence, 27 league games without defeat. Tony McLaughlin also brings height to the Chelsea set pieces. Dibble is impeded. And the goal counts, and it's Kerry Dixon's. As Dixon, as he got away from Gale, he has. It's Wilson in the centre, 2-0 to Chelsea. Blake dispossessed, and it's an amazing break by Chelsea. And Tony DiRigo, who goes round Dibble and finishes it all in style. April 22nd, the visitors to Stamford Bridge, Leeds United. One more win would seal promotion. Once again, the old rivals met in a game of more than ordinary significance. Dixon will keep it in. No bloke's been pulled wide. Kerry Dixon, the turn by Wilson. Bumstead, Chelsea are ahead. John Bumstead, their longest serving player. 1-0, guaranteed promotion. Manchester City's defeat at Main Road the same day meant that Chelsea were champions too. They took delivery of the trophy at the end of the final home game. When the party was over, the chairman returned to a serious issue that had clouded Chelsea's long-term planning for several years. They don't own Stamford Bridge. Negotiations to buy it have been tortuous. But the board have pressed ahead with plans for yet another new bridge. Plans that would surely get the nod from the shade of Gus Mears, whose vision started it all. What Stamford Bridge is going to be for our supporters is home for home. Whatever they would expect to find in their home, they will find at Stamford Bridge. When? When is a good question. I can't answer that, simply because we haven't resolved the legal position over the ground yet. But, but it is inevitable. The timing is uncertain. 